What I always used to wonder about when I was a young person, starting when I was eight years old in the third grade, was who was going to protect the animals? Who's going to stand up for nature? Who's going to get in the way and, and protect them? Because the animals were always so beautiful to me. And yet they seem so vulnerable to the things that, that, men, and, that mankind does to them. So for all of my life, I was always looking for how could I somehow save the natural world? How could I, how could I protect it? And it seemed that I cared a lot. Sometimes I wondered, it was almost like it was a pain. It hurt to see what was happening to nature. And I wanted to, to do something. And I think I spent a long portion of my, my early years looking for the teachings that I was seeking and looking for the allies that I was seeking. Life led me to Australia and I came uh, to meet the Aboriginal Australians. And in the Aboriginal Australians I found the allies that I was seeking. I worked at a college that was for adult Aboriginal people, a college that had been designed by them for themselves to uh, work with a, a, a group within their community who wanted to go back to school but didn't really have the skills to go back to school. And so I became the country western guitar teacher at the Aboriginal Community College. And this was back in 1978. The old men from the central desert, they really enjoyed me. And they thought I was funny, funny white boy. And they used to call me over and they used to say, white boy, come, sit. And they began to tell me things and they began to teach me. And they saw that I had an open mind and they saw that I had a passion uh, for, for nature. And they began to teach me uh, about why things were the way they were. And they also taught me about uh, the way people had been treating each other here within our human family. And it was something that, that was... Uh, also very distressing to me, the history that I had inherited. And so as the young, as the old men taught me, um, they, they noticed that I was retaining a lot of what they were telling me. And this training went on for, for a year or two years. And uh, one day, one of the old men looked at me and he said, young fella, we're going to go away now. We're not going to see you again. And then he rubbed my skin and he said, white boy, you got a good camouflage. Nobody's going to know that we taught you all these things. And what we want you to do is we want you to go into the world and we want you to find where the door is closed to the Aborigine and we want you to open it from the inside. And I said, uncle, I'll try and do the best that I can. He said, these young people are going to come to you and when they come to you, we want you to be generous like we were with you. We don't want you to be stingy. And we're not giving this to you for yourself. We're giving this to you so that you can pass it on to the young people. And I said, I'll do the best that I can. A few years later, I went to the United States and a, a friend suggested that I go meet uh, another young fellow whose name was Tom Brown. He had a tracking school in New Jersey, and when I met him, I met another man who was as passionate about saving the earth as, as I was. I went through his uh, basic uh, course, his standard course, and I realized that the old man had schooled my mind in a wonderful way, and it was as if I was born to the skills that Tom was teaching. It was as if I was born to be a tracker, born to do the survival skills, make fire, make shelter. I could do all of the different psychic exercises because the old men had trained my mind. And what I found in Tom Brown was that there was a curriculum and a way that these old skills could be taught in this world. And it was so exciting to me. And I literally ran back to Australia. And I ran back to my friends and my teachers and I said, there's a way for us to share these skills in this modern world. And I shared with them the idea that we needed to go find the trackers, that the trackers of the tribe, the, those, those individuals who could go out ahead of the tribe carrying nothing, 
living off the land, knowing how to heal themselves, feed themselves, shelter themselves. They were holding on to a, a library of knowledge and that we needed to contact them and we needed to utilize their services again. Because in the past, I learned the trackers were always the trainers of the young men, the young women. They were the ones who taught the young people of a tribe. This is how our people feel about this place, how we feel about this this animal, how we feel about this bird, this tree. This is his name. This is where he came from. And so I wanted to take tracking and put it back into the place where it had always been traditionally. That the trackers were literally uh, priests of nature. That they brought the voice of the natural world into the human realm. That they carried the voice of the animals into the human council. And that the animals were treated as equals, as, as even um, our superiors, that they are our teachers. They've been here for such a long time. They have so much to teach us, and we cannot survive without them. So my friend, Kevin O'Loughlin, Dookie, he said to me, John, one of the best trackers in Australia lives just down the road. His name's Uncle Jimmy James. So we went to Uncle Jimmy's house, and we invited him to come to the college and share his knowledge with our students and when Uncle Jimmy shared his his skills and his tracking all oh, the heads of all the Aboriginal students came up and they realized we were all like this we were all magnificent like this and I saw this tracking this is the sword that can cut through the Gordian knot of our times this is the awareness this is the the, uh, the skills the skill set that we need to to save this world I became a friend of Uncle Jimmy and I traveled with him in the early 1980s from until 1984 when I returned to the United States. And Uncle Jimmy taught me as much as he could. He was Pichanjara and I did not speak Pichanjara so he could only teach me as much as he could in the English that he had. But by watching him, by observing him, by just palling around with him when he went to visit his friends, telling stories about tracking jobs that he had done. I absorbed his essence and I learned so much from him. He was a marvelous human being and to this day he's considered to be one of the best trackers in a, in a continent full of marvelous trackers. When I returned to the United States, I had not been here but a month and I was contacted by some people from the Mohawk Nation, from Akwazasne in upstate New York. And they said to me, we heard that you've learned some wonderful things, and we'd like to see an example of what you learned. We walked out into the woods and they said, what do you see? And I told them, I see this and that and this and that. And they looked at each other and they said, can you share that with our young people? This is something we haven't seen in a couple hundred years. And so all of a sudden, not having known what I was going to do with the skills that Uncle Jimmy had taught me, I suddenly had a job and I had a purpose. I began to do camps with Ray Fadden and John Fadden at the Six Nations Indian Museum in Onchiota, New York. And the chiefs and the clan mothers of the Confederacy would come and they would observe what I was doing. Ray Fadden looked at me and he says, you don't have to explain to me what you're going to do. He said, I did what you're doing in the 30s and the 40s. And all these chiefs and clan mothers, all these leaders, they were all my campers. I know that what you're doing leads to good things. And then I guess I did well enough that the word was passed to other nations, other native nations here in North America. And so I began to work with other people. And that led me to uh, the Southwest, where I live at this time. And I worked with the Pueblo people and I worked with the Navajo Nation. And it was evident that one of the pieces that had been lost in our history was the care and the training that used to take place when a young man became of the age where he would be initiated. And without initiation, we see that young men get up to all kinds of no good business. And yet when their minds are set straight and when they're taken out on their their walkabout, when they're trained by their uncles, when the young girls are trained by their aunties. Uh, half of what we need to know, we already have when we come into this world. 
the other half we have to be taught. It's something that our human family has learned over thousands and thousands of years. And without that training, all things can really go astray. So we began a series of camps and nobody really had any money to pay me. So I had to start a nonprofit so that I could write grants, get some money, pay myself to do this work which I felt to be so important. How sad it would be if we didn't hold on to the knowledge that people have gathered carefully and lovingly and passed down from person to person, generation to generation for 50,000 years. What a, what a tragedy that would be. Because this planet is so beautiful and, and our vocation has never been to destroy the planet. How foolish it would be, one of the clan mothers, uh, Audrey Shenandoah said, how foolish it is to think that you're superior to the thing that sustains you. How can you be superior to the earth when everything we need to live comes from the earth? <clears throat> so it was never our vocation to destroy the earth. It was always men's vocation to care for the earth, to, to spend a large portion of their life in ceremonies and practices that actually protect this beautiful planet that we call home. <clears throat> 